welcome to another episode of Gar Boris's Time Machine. Now, Gar, um, this time we're going to do something a little different and fun. We've been wanting to do this show for quite a while. We're, you and me are going to talk about some of our all-time favorite TV show things. And this, for me, was very hard to do because there's just so many of them to do. But I kind of went with my first instinct. And um, so, how you want to you want to tell us what are some of your favorite themes, uh, Gar? Oh my gosh, I've got so many. You know, uh, most most of the um, TV shows, uh, you know, that I'm, you know, more uh, personally attached to are, are going to be the stuff from the 60s and the 70s. Oh, that's great. Um, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. The 80s and the 90s, you know, I kind of, you know, tuned out, you know, started becoming, you know, more involved, I guess, in music yeah, yeah. and things like that. So I wasn't as, you know, drawn to, you know, uh, that type of entertainment and stuff like that. So I don't, I don't have as much of a, a personal attachment, but just because I don't have a personal attachment doesn't mean that those ones aren't special, you know what I mean, to people. Yeah, well, here's the thing, you know, we got the idea to do a show because um, many of the episodes we were doing, we, we always are bringing up, you know, how important music is, um, you know, in relation to both um, TV and movies. And um, I think it was our episode, which uh, people can currently check out on the Flintstones, where we brought up the fact that one of the things we loved about the Flintstones, like a lot of these great classic TV shows, was that great theme song. The minute the theme song comes on, you know, uh, um, you just start singing away, you know, all the words, and there's no denying, you know, what that is a theme song to. And that, that is really what it uh, makes a, a great TV show theme to me, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Fl <laughs> I, I, I actually have uh, the Flintstones you know, on cue. Okay, so let's hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> The Flintstones. <laughs> Okay, I just had to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It takes me back. And you know, Gar, see, that, that is why um, these songs mean, like you say, oh, well, you know, when I, I got a little older into the 80s, you know, TV didn't mean as much, but, but just just your reaction to that song, that that song has a, that, that TV show, that, that song right there, every time you hear it, 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 you know, it's got a special place in your heart. Yeah, and I, I even liked the uh, the closing, you know, where yeah, yeah. he gets uh, put outside by the cat, yeah. and he's banging on the door. Oh, yeah. yeah. You get all into it. Neighbors. You get all into it. It's funny that, because um, you not only pay attention to the words, like you said, but until you just, you know, were saying that, I forgot myself, like, I'd always, you know, as it's ending, even, you know, like you said, I, I remember yelling, yeah, Wilma, you know. You, you, you click into certain things, certain things of a song. And, um, you know, that's really what all these songs on the list that I, I came up with, like um, Happy Days. That's another one of those songs that um, it, it just, it, you know, it, it's, it's a great rock and tune. It gets you really um, kind of getting ready to get into the, this week's episode. And, and you start singing along. Now, the interesting thing about Happy Days is, is I sent you some of the stuff, Gar, and I don't know if, because, um, like, unless you're really paying attention, sometimes you, you miss some of this stuff, but, like, from 1974 to 75, the first year of a show was on there, it had a different opening tune, which was Happy Days. Now, Happy Days was written by Max C. Friedman and James E. Meyer. And now, um, here's, here's what you uh, may not have noticed. Did you ever notice, like, after the first year, they, they started using the theme um, Rock Around the Clock, which was an um, old tune by Bill Haley and the Comets. Well, yeah, that was the original. Uh, the, the first season they did the uh, Bill Haley and the Comets. Okay, yeah. And, and then after, uh, they, they wound up going to the, uh, the Happy Days theme, you know, that yeah, yeah, ran yeah. the rest of the seasons. And, uh, you know, I... You know, I, I you know, both of them fit. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, because Bill Hay, you know, that was a very, very popular song, um, you know, during uh, the actual 50s. But, 
you know, I mean, the uh, the the one that they actually had written for the show when uh, when they started using it from the second season on, yeah. uh, it, it just, uh, you know, I mean, that's the one that most people really, you know, embrace. Yeah. I actually, I actually have that one on, you know, I mean, tell me if you want to hear it. Or sure, sure, it. sure. Okay, here we go. Oh yeah, that's taking me back. That's taking me back. Oh gosh! And now again, awesome. I remember. I remember watching that. Yeah. Show. That show was so popular. Oh yeah, you know. Back um, in the day. Oh yeah, that's one of my all-time favorite. Um, shows and we're definitely going to do an episode on that uh, because there's just so much stuff to talk about um happy days but keeping it to the music see happy days like you said um the the guy that produced it and created it and, and did all the writing gary marshall um he wanted a show you know based around like the time he grew up in the, the 50s and what's very interesting about happy days is he if you look at every spe aspect of happy days uh down to the music and the, the type of clothes they wore and, and, and the type of furniture they had on the set that were in, in the house, at Cunningham House, for example. Um, you have no doubt that, that that's supposed to you know take place in the 50s. And even the music that they, um, even though this is show that's on in the 70s about the 50s, I mean, it looked pretty uh, 50s, you know, authentic. And even down to the music, like they, they weren't playing any Michael Jackson. And, you know, for example, in an episode of Happy Days, you, you never got that. That's why they were very um, selective about the music that they would put in each of the episodes. Well, what's funny to me is back in those days, um, when I was in high school back in the 70s, yeah. um, they used to have a, a, a 50s where, you know, everybody, you know, dress up like they're from the 50s yeah, yeah. and come to, come to school, you know, kind of one of those things. Yeah. And it's so funny because nowadays uh, that's become the 80s. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so now, you know, they, they're kind of doing the same thing that we used to do back when I was in high school, and it used to be targeted, you know, for, and now they're, they're doing the 80s. So, oh, gosh, that makes me feel Oh, old. yeah. And now, you know, Gar, we could just have be doing a show here about all our favorite um, TV uh, theme shows, but I want to get a little more deeper than that. And, and so I started thinking, because uh, and I think you'd have appreciation for us being a musician yourself and a guy that's written original music. Um I thought let's go a little deeper and let's let's um, look into some of the people that kind of wrote these tunes and who they are. Um, now, in re regards to Happy Days, okay, um, Pratt and McLean, um, they were a 1970s one-hit wonder band that scored a number five hit on Billboard, if you can believe it, with the song Happy Days, the, the, the very theme song from the popular TV show Happy Days. It hit number five on the Billboard chart, if you can believe that. Well, you know, it, you know, a lot of people like the song. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but again, you don't think of TV theme shows um, hitting the Billboard chart, but some of these songs we're going to be talking about were that popular, but they actually did appear on the Billboard chart. And, and we were talking about Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley and his Comets. It took over as a new theme to Happy Days and said 1976. Um, the theme, okay, so again, um, Happy Days was like a supposed to take place in the in the 50s and um like even like arnold's drive-in if you which was the the the, game, the kids hangout and stuff um i mean they had drive-ins like that back in the day where you know the, the waitress would come on her roller skates up to your car and you know take your order it was very um it was very specific for that time you know oh absolutely that's that was a very popular thing uh you know to go uh, to uh, a place and and drive up and and order your meal and, and do all of that stuff. Uh, Sonic uh, kind of tried to you know you know keep mm -hmm. that going as as a as a unique uh, for that that fast food chain, but I, I don't think it, <laughs> I don't think it really lasted all that long because I don't really see uh, girls you know riding yeah, yeah. roller skates taking your food out to your car. But originally Sonic. Uh, that was uh, a, a thing behind you know, a uniqueness uh, to to uh, them as a fast food chain. But like you said, uh, I remember. And it was yeah. a common thing back in the yeah. 50s that yeah. a lot of places had that. 
Oh yeah, but I I remember like watching Happy Days and thinking to myself, man, I wish I could would have been alive, you know, when they had places like that. But um, yeah, you know, and then another song I, I thought we needed to kind of talk about here was um, the theme to Good Times. Now, Good Times was of course another big um, Norman Lear hit on um, in the '70s, and um, of course starred um, John Amos and uh, Jim um, Jimmy J J Walker. Um, yes. But you know, um, the, the theme itself, I mean. Because it was a um, you know a family about a I think they're probably the first black American family on TV and um, so it's very important when you're picking out a theme song to kind of have something that's kind of um, you know like I guess kind of like an R&B R and B type song something that um, black people can kind of relate to and this is kind of um, I don't know how you'd want to describe the good times theme but it's kind of really upbeat it's kind of um, it's a different kind of tune but again. I put it on my list because it's one of those shows I always watch. And again, every time the, an episode would start, I'd be singing along to the uh, theme. It's just one of those songs I could never get out of my head. Well, that, you know, and, and uh, the catchphrase, uh, I think... Um, Dynamite. Was the originator of the catchphrase for comedy TV. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, when he started saying, Dine, oh my, you know, it, yeah. it just became such a, a popular thing that it just became reoccurring through the show. And then other shows started to uh, come up with their own catchphrases. But it was actually JJ uh, that started that trend. Yeah, and, you know, I think... Um and we're going to do an episode on good times down the line, but I was reading um, in reference to that, that catchphrase caused a lot of um, friction between the cast members for the simple fact that it was something that happened almost accidentally. And then um, when the producers and writers started to see how popular the phrase, um, you know, kids start automatically saying like Dino might, it became a thing without them even, it's not something they wrote into, you know, the script saying, um, Oh, we're going to come up with the catchphrase. He, I think he did it one day, and, they, and when they seen the um, audience's reaction, they just said, "Okay, we're going to make that a regular thing." And, and some of the other actors in the shows, they're like, "Oh, Dino my, Dino my, that you know, this is supposed to be a serious show. It's you know, he's looking like a clown and all this." Um, so it's kind of funny that while it was good for the show, that it um, created a lot of um, a lot of problems between some of the cast members. They didn't like it. They they thought it made the show kind of a, a, a goof and people weren't taking it as serious which i kind of think hey, it's a catch it's, it's a fun little catchphrase like you said and i think the fact that it, would, it happened so organically and wasn't something that was kind of um purposely done it just kind of happened on its own makes it that much um cooler i, I remember going to school in the 70s they, um as a result of um him saying dynamite on the show they started having a magazine um that, that they would call dynamite <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think I think it was you know there were there were some uh, very serious actors that had been uh, acting for a long time, and and they had a uh, you know a uh, reputation and everything that they they had kind of uh, earned. Yeah. And then and then JJ, the guy that played JJ, was kind of really you know not a well known. Uh, stand-up he was just actor. starting well he was more of a stand-up comedian yeah yeah and and so all of a sudden when he came up with that catchphrase it just catapulted him uh into stardom where his uh name on the marquee would be above their names and i think that might have to do oh yeah i, I was reading all about that and, and and you're right because originally it was supposed to be because um People did know John Amos, the guy that played the father, um, previously from um, him being on Mary Tyler Moore, and so it was. And then um, it was actually a spinoff of Bod, and so yes. um, and so, um, like you said, he, uh, um, Jimmy Walker's character of JJ became so popular, um, they had to change it to starring Jimmy Walker, and the other actors really did not like him getting the top billing. But that's that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because after the success of the dynamite catchphrase, um, other shows, like you said, started would purposely be trying to create um, little catchphrases. And, and it's funny the um, talking about pop culture, the effect it has on us in our everyday life. I mean, so much like even Happy Days. Okay, Fonzie. It sounds silly now, but 
his catchphrase was a exactly. or or um Richie golly G uh-huh. golly G uh-huh. uh <laughs> You know, just little things, and they became such a big part of our lives that, like, when you hear about catchphrase, oh, golly gee, Fonz, uh, we know that's Richie, or Fonzie, not even, it's not even a word, not even a phrase, just, eh, but that became his character, his personality, so much that if you remember when Happy Days first started, Fonzie didn't even wear a leather jacket, he wore this other kind of, um, to me, if you go back, you're like, oh, that doesn't look all that cool. But they, they started to realize, we want, the, we want the audience to kind of think this guy's cool. we got to put on a leather jacket. And they kind of, you know, they, they, they turned the Fonz into something else than what he originally was. Well, they kind of turned him into the guy that lived on the other side of the track. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, was, he had his good side and everything, yeah. and, you know, but, but he, was, he was the one character that... Uh, people that you know were from the other side of the tracks could relate to on the show. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, yeah. every time I you know I run into somebody that you know can you know the the classic you know hitting the jukebox on the side and then all that's, yeah yeah that's playing, what we think of you know uh, anytime I see somebody that you know winds up doing that with some type of a machinery all yeah. of a sudden they hit it on the side and it starts working I go hey the fawn. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny you say that because that was my reaction too. Like, I I mean, it, it's funny the way TV and pop culture and all this stuff can affect us. I mean, it affected me the way the TV creators wanted me to react to it. You know, like, I thought, man, that, that Fonzie, he's just the coolest guy, man. I wish I could be like that. Yeah, he was the, the leather jacket and then the motorcycle. You know, to the tr- another trippy thing is... I'm pretty sure that that motorcycle he was driving around. I think it's was a, a, yeah. A early, early, early old Harley Davidson. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> before they started making like hogs and these big giant, you know, because back in the '50s it was it was before the '60s when they started doing these, you know, really powerful motor motorcycles and stuff. Oh yeah. And I I think. Um, the motorcycle he was driving around. I'm pretty sure it was an old, old Harley Davidson. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Fonzie was so cool that sometimes, like, when he'd get in these situations or he'd be trying to save other kids from getting beat up or something, he would just have yeah. to he would just have to give a look or not even say anything. He's so cool that people would back off, like, right away. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, it yeah. was the Fonz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but, man, it was just another... You know, super popular show. You know, from way back, way back in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you know, just just loved that show. You know, it, you know, as a kid. You and know, you, and you know, school the next day. Yeah. And talk oh yeah, about it's like you see episodes like, you saw the night before. Like they, like we've talked about before. You know, in the water cooler, going to work. People, you know, back in the day when these shows were on. I mean. Happy Days, for example, we're talking about, was one of the longest running shows. It ran, I think, all the way to 1984. So, you know, 10, 11 seasons or something like that. Um, they don't, TV shows, like you said, Gar, they don't last that long anymore because they're not of the same, um, you, you know, quality. I mean, and, and, and these shows were so good that all these years later, I, you know, I still catch reruns and repeats. I've seen them a thousand times. I've got DVD collections. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen it. it to me, it's, they say classic TV. I never tire of them because these TV shows that we grew up on were of that quality. Well, it seems like, uh, it, it, you know, over the years, attention span yeah. ha- has become shorter and shorter and shorter uh, because, you know, uh, and, and then there's economics yeah. You know, in it because uh, back back in those days, you know, back in the '60s and the '70s, um, you know, it, you know, TV shows. There was many, many episodes. I mean, just like a, a, a really large amount of episodes that would be done in an entire season. Yeah, and then and then they would uh, you know do the re- reruns, and you would watch the reruns until the next season came and. And there was so many reruns that it could and, keep you and the cool you know, thing is audience you, entertained until you're waiting 
again for the, uh, the New next episode. season to come along. And the cool thing nowadays, about that, yeah. yeah w- w- nowadays, everything, you know, if, if you look on the internet, uh, you know, there's a, a long season is like 12 episodes. Oh, yeah. And, and the cool thing you about know, that is, go on yeah. The internet. Back in the day, you and, could you could miss one week and say, oh, "Okay, you know what? I miss I miss this week, but they'll they'll replay it. I'll I'll get to catch up on it." <laughs> yeah, but but you know nowadays, you know there's some seasons uh, for TV shows yeah. that are what like six episodes. That's and you can even it. you can even go on YouTube as, in regards to all these classic TV shows we're talking about, and, and they got a lot of, of these old like oh Happy Days season one, you know uh, episode one, season one or whatever. You can go and find a lot of this stuff if you've never. Um, seen it if you just want to go and kind of check out what some of the stuff we're t- now another song I had to include on my list Gar was All in the Family now we did we did a whole episode talking about how great that show was for all these different reasons but that theme song see that's another one of those episodes this one um, All in the Family and Flintstones we did an episode on those two shows we were saying that's what really makes a great uh, TV theme show uh, is it's one of these songs that you just kind of sing along with but what made this show this theme song that much better is you got the two main stars of a show, they're up on stage singing the song. And and like we were talking, we did the All in the Family episode, um, Carol Connor, who of course played Archie Bunker, and Gene Stapleton played Edith Bunker, his wife, um, before they would record the show every week, um, you know, and do live tape in front of the audience, um, they would come out and there'd be a piano on stage and they would sing the lyrics to the um, theme song. They'd do it live. And, and you know, you think, okay, well, they're going to do that one time, and maybe we'll play for the live audience, you know, um, a recording of it every week. No, they would they would do it every single week, you know, because they'd have a different audience every week, so they would do a different performance of that same song. But that's what, to me, like, drew me in um, to that show, um, besides how great it was, was a the theme song, and I love the fact that the two main stars were singing it. Yeah, I've got it on cue if you'd like to hear it. Yeah, let's hear that. Okay, here we go. Oh, I just love it. I just love when she hits that note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And see... I love her voice in there, man. And see, it was very authentic. But she makes it... Yeah. Just so comical. Yeah, see, that's what I was going to say. It, it's so authentic. It's not like they were even trying to do it. And, you know, as they're singing it, first of all, the, if you listen to pay attention to the lyrics, they're very fitting for um, the time of the show. Um, you know, Archie's political views, it all kind of comes out in the song. Edith, um, like you said, she sings it in a comical way. And, and there's even episodes where she's singing in the episodes, and you can see Archie does, is not a big fan of her singing. So this. <laughs> So it's very staying true to the characters as they're singing, and, and I, I think that's what makes that so authentic. Is that it's one of those songs you just as soon as you hear, it, you start singing along. Yeah, you know, it's, man, that's you know, at that time, I think it was, uh, you know, it was uh, the longest running show, uh, TV show, and it, and it held that uh, distinction for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, but and and nowadays, you know, shows uh, having that long yeah. of a duration of popularity, I I don't think um, that you know that you know I think the days of those type of shows having uh, that long of a run. Oh sure. You know, it, 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 the whole thing has has changed. So um, you know, I think it'll go down in history. You know, kind of ho- you know being considered one of those bands. I mean, I mean, one of those shows uh, that that ha- has the distinction of extremely long uh, shelf life. Oh, yeah, you know, and, and a lot of a reason for that, Gar, is like we've talked in previous episodes, um, back in the 70s and 80s especially, um, the, the networks and the producers and all the people behind the shows, they would give the show a chance to kind of, um, you know, to build its audience. Whereas, like, you know, you have all these um, things that you're developing on, you know, Netflix or these other streaming services, and... If it's not a hit by the third episode, a lot of the times they'll just scrap the whole thing and um, you know move on to something else, and, um, and and that's a very sad thing. But now getting to the next, um, and you tell me what you think. But the next song I have on my list is um, Three's Company, Come and Knock on Our Door. Again, um, that's one of my all-time favorite TV shows, 
Um, I never get. I mean, I can see, I can see every single episode over and over. I got, I got every single season on uh, DVD. But, but the theme song again. Um, I even have a friend that kind of jokes when he comes over. Hey, let's let's uh, put on Three's Company. Uh, come and knock on your door. You know, we we start singing. We immediately know what it, what it is. It's it, um, it just and then again, I wanted to go a little deeper and kind of um, and I'm glad I did. I found some interesting um, facts about the people that are kind of behind the song. Um, Okay, Three's Company um, was performed by Ray Charles, not that Ray Charles, but um, uh, yeah. the song was written by um, this guy, Joe Raposo, who, um, who was born on uh, February 1937. He died on February 5th, 1989. Now, um, just a few days before he, um, his 52nd birthday. Now, I felt the need to put all that information in here because... Um, Okay, so this poor this poor guy um, dies relatively young at fifty, you know, just before he's about ready to turn fifty-two. But um, you know, think think of what that accomplishment that is in his fifty-two year life. He's got not just this one great uh, theme song, but um, Joe Raposo also um, was a songwriter for the Sesame Street theme, as uh -huh. well as as well as a Cookie Monster song. C is for Cookie, Cookie good enough for me, and. Um, <laughs> And he also wrote the theme for the Ropers. Now, now he probably got that gig after the um, success of a Three's Company um, theme because you know it's the same producers and the same people behind the Rope the, the Roper show. And um, it just kind of got me thinking because um, I, I was doing some research, come to discover a lot of these guys that write like TV themes that they um, they write other things too. And so I, I was interested to kind of find okay the guy behind. Um, the the, the um, Three's Company theme. He actually wrote music for Sesame Street and the Ropers. So that, that's kind of interesting, you know, that um, because like uh, you know, children's music like for Sesame Street is totally a different um, game. But this this guy was, you know, he had that kind of talent as a songwriter. And um, finally, in regards to the Three's Company theme, um, this guy Ray Charles was a leader of the Ray Charles Singers, who were featured on Perry Como records and TV shows for 35 years. Um, he died at the age of 96 of cancer. Now, again, I thought, let's shed a little um, light on these guys that wrote some of these um, TV theme songs we're talking about. And, um, and and while I know Ray Charles, you know, this Ray Charles for for um, performing the Three's Company theme, I had no idea that he had anything to do with um, Perry Como, who was um, quite a big uh, TV performer back in the day. Quite oh, he was. I mean, I remember um, my grandmother would always love listening, watching his Christmas specials and all that. He was quite popular. So to find out the guy that, you know, um, that, that performed the Three's Company theme, I thought, oh, wow. So he was on TV 35 years before that. You know, how interesting. <laughs> well, you know, he's you know, making a living. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm with you. Uh -huh. You know, once you hear uh, that that opening, there we go. Oh, you're taking me back, Art man. Every time I hear that, oh I, my god! I mean, I I, 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 I dare oh say. That's got to be one of probably my top TV show ever. I mean, um, John Ritter. I just loved him as a comedian. I mean, the the man died so tragically young, and um, and the guy that plays his best friend on the show, um, Larry, was um, played by the the actor who played him was um, Richard Klein, and and I seen Richard Klein in an interview um, a couple years ago um, when it was the 40th anniversary of Three's Company, and he was talking about the fact uh, with other cast members that. Um, that him and John Ritter were such good friends that, that it affects him that um, so much that he's not able to even watch these great classic TV shows that, that he was on because it, uh, you know because it, it brings back memories. Yeah, he I starts, can, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Was, you know. In fact, he, he yeah, he's, uh, he used to be a uh, very popular stand-up comedian too. Yeah, who are you talking about, Richard Klein or John Ritter? Yes. You're yeah, Richard Klein. and and he directs he directs like plays and he teaches how, um, kids how to act and that and and he's quite up there now he's like seventy something years old as a, or of other cast members but like I said John Ritter he he died tragically young he was fifty two or something like that and um, 
but he left us with all this um, great comedy, and he 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 um, went into have a movie career. And what what's amazing is that the character he's most remembered for, even he did all these great movies and these other TV series. The the thing he's most remembered for, of course, is um, the role of Jack Tripper. <laughs> but well, you know, I mean, Jack Tripper uh, catapulted. Yeah. You know him into stardom. Oh yeah. And uh, you know he he you know he uh, he wound up um, having a really good uh, career. Um, Suzanne Summers, uh, she she had a, a stint where uh, her and her husband were uh, you know pressuring uh, the producers of the show to pay her yeah. like an, what was considered at the time like an outrageous amount of money yeah. uh, per episode because she was making this stance that she was the star of the show and she was the one that was carrying the show yeah and and they wound up uh letting her go over, yeah over that and then replacing her with uh, other people and uh the show wound up uh still staying popular and still staying on uh for many years after and yeah because um, i mean was, um the other was, two uh, yeah. the addition of don Knotts. oh yeah and, uh, you know you know it, it was it was it was a very entertaining show with a very simple... Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of the jokes are just simple, what to most people would be simple misunderstanding, the sexual innuendos. Uh, exactly. But, people but, getting the yeah. wrong impression of what somebody said. I mean, and, and, and the thing I don't know that they would get away with, but I mean, it was, it was funny at the time, is... Um, him having to lie about being gay to the landlord so that they would let him live there with two girls. I mean, I mean, um, for its time in the se 70s and 80s, it was um, many people considered to be a real risque show in the sense of, oh my God, a guy living with two girls, what? And they're not married. Um, I mean, today it, it kind of looked as like everyday life. I mean, how many people have done that, you know? Yeah, but back in those days, it was uh, it was a uh, forbidden territory. Yeah. It just really shows you how society shifts. Yeah, and again, if you, you watch know? any of the episodes of Three's Company, you look at um, you look at you know how they're wearing their hair. You look at the clothes. Um, you can tell from the clothes and that that they're wearing. Um, you can tell. Okay, that that was that's a show from the seventies or eighties because of how they're dressing and stuff. And but um, again, it's one of those shows that I never. Um, you know, tire of and talking about Suzanne Summers. Um, I, I hear talk about um, you know how she was fired from a show and she claims she was doing it for um, you know girl power because she thought women should be paid as much as the men. But I, I I remember at the time that people saying that she thought she she should be the star of Three's Company. Where let's let's be honest, John Ritter John Ritter was a breakout star of that show and and, and I think if he had been the one that was let go, I don't think people would have been tuning into that show anymore. I think you've got a really good point there. Yeah. You know, I, you know he was much more of a difference maker, and, and uh, the producers basically made that point mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, the actions that they took. You yeah. Know, uh, and, and not meaning anything yeah, yeah. towards Suzanne Summers because, no. you know, you, you can't uh, really... Uh, you know, she was she was trying to use negotiation yeah. power. Oh yeah, but here's unfortunately she miscalculated on on the decision that she made. Yeah. But you can't uh, say that what she was doing at you know because what yeah. she was doing at that time was kind of groundbreaking. Where yeah. nowadays what she did is established a norm. And everybody's doing it these days. I mean, um, yes. And, and the thing about it is though, she she. In a way, she paid for it because not only did she get fired, but um, the producers and the people that she was negotiating with, they gave her such a bad reputation and making um, other people in the Hollywood industry um, thinking that she was so difficult to work with that um, it wasn't until the 90s till she um, finally got another chance um, to... Uh, show with Patrick Yeah, step by step. Yeah. Yes. And so, because yes. she had this reputation for many years of being difficult to work with, so... Finally, somebody gave her a break, and you know, and it was nothing like um, the role she played on Three's Company. Maybe that's why it worked, but um, you know, it, it was a good show, and um, so you know, good for good for her. But um, that, yeah, that's that's the thing. That's how some of these things work. Now, um, we already um, 
talked about um, um, the Flintstones theme, so I'll move on to the next song I, I came up with. Welcome back, Cotter. Now, I included this because, um, again, I, I, I love the show. I could, I could watch it over and over, but, but the thing is, it's the theme song that really sticks in your head. And um, now, until I, I didn't realize until I did the research on this that um, the guy that is singing the song is um, singer John Sebastian, that he, he's previously, before he had this hit um, with the song Welcome Back, um, I get, the song itself is called Welcome Back. He was in. He was a lead singer for this uh, band, The Love and Spoonful, who they had a um, they had a hit with um, "Do You Believe in Magic?" So you probably like that's probably um, where you first heard this guy. But um, I at the time I had no idea it was the same guy that's saying "Do You Believe in Magic?" But um, before he even had the uh, success of "Welcome Back, Cotter," theme, uh, he also appeared as a solo artist back in 1969 at Woodstock. Yes, he was a very successful musician uh, long before he, uh, you know, came up with that uh, mm. theme song for that show. And uh, you know, you know, I was I was a kid and I was listening to the radio when he was just being a uh, musician. Yeah. Uh, but you know, then uh, you know when he, uh, you know, when he came out with, you know, he got basically hired to come up with that. Yeah, yeah. And um, and when he uh, wrote, you know, he couldn't, originally they were uh, asking him to write it for Cotter. Yeah, and he couldn't, uh, yeah. They were just going to name the show Cotter. Yeah. And, but because he had such difficulty uh, uh, doing uh, rhyming lyrics, uh, with Cotter, because yeah, yeah. it's it's such a difficult thing. Yeah, um, he came up with "Welcome Back," and the producers loved it so much. The song "Welcome Back," they de- they changed the name. Yeah, yeah. To "Welcome Back, Cotter," and, and, and he, he tried to tie the whole thing together. And if you listen um, to the lyrics, it, he, he really yeah. uh, felt when they uh, hired him to to uh, to write the theme for that show he really you know he watched episodes and read scripts and all of that stuff and he felt that he could really come up with something good for that show and obviously he was right because honestly that 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 one has to be you know if not in the top 10 yeah quite possibly considering the top five. Oh yeah and, and and here's here's the thing with that um is that like you said the song itself um is not called welcome back cotter it's called welcome back and yes. and he he had he like you said they wanted to use the word cotter but he 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 made if you listen to the lyrics they really relate to the show because he he wrote the lyrics to relate to the character of cotter and it's talking about this guy that coming back to all these years later to teach at the school where he grew up on these other you know kids that are having having trouble so um and i also was reading um Another thing is, Welcome Back, um, besides um, hit, uh, besides being a hit on the Billboard chart, um, it also hit, like, number 93 on the country chart. What? Yeah, I, I was reading this today, t- doing research, and then... <laughs> Boy, you dug that one up, because I, I never yeah. heard that. Well, well, what I did is, um, if you go to um, the Welcome Cotter Wikipedia, it'll... Um, on the side, it'll tell you like um, the theme song. Click on where it says theme song, and uh-huh. it, it gives you a little history on, on the, the song itself. And uh, that's that's where I got that. But um, also in that little email I sent you, Garvey, there's a video of um, John Sebastian kind of with just him and his guitar performing the song somewhere. Um, it became that big of a hit that um, they wanted him to go perform it somewhere on TV. Oh, absolutely. And and a lot of people don't know this, but. Mm-hmm. That was uh, the show that catapulted John Travolta. Oh yeah, to yeah. Stardom, uh, yeah. Because he was, uh, uh, you know, nobody knew who he was, and and uh, he started uh, uh, overshadowing uh, the 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 Cotter character in popularity. He became the most popular character on the show. In fact, his his movie career really started to rocket so much to the point that eventually he left the show, and they'd bring him back occasionally for like a guest spot. But they they had his character like drop out of school, and um, once he left the show and his movie career kind of rocketed, the 
show wasn't as popular, and, and that's really what kind of um, caused the show to go off there. But in talking about John Sebastian and the theme song here, it, it's kind. I was kind of interested to learn. Okay, so a lot of people would think, okay, this guy got his like, you know, he's the people would think might maybe initially you don't, don't really do the research. Oh, this guy John Sebastian, you know, he's one of these one-hit wonders. But no, he actually had quite a bit of fame before this song "Welcome Back" had ever um, been written or anything. So that's that's what kind of I think is kind of cool. This guy um, kind of gets his career gets a second life, if you will, um, after he's had all all the success in the music industry already. Absolutely, you got you hit the head of the nail. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know, it, it you know uh, it, it really showed his ability to write a song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because he, you know, that's he was the guy that was carrying Loving Spoonful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you know, I mean, when when anybody thinks of that band, nobody really remembers the names of any of the other musicians that were yeah, and, in, and, and in this... that group. But everybody sure knows who John Sebastian is. Yeah, and and and, and what what a great kind of career to have, like. You know, but you, you get so popular at one point after you leave, leave the leave, Love and Spoonful that you even get to appear at Woodstock in 1969 as a solo artist, and then then a few years later down the line, like in 1976, like your career gets a real kick in the ass, if you will, with this um, hit theme song from the hit TV show Welcome Back, Cotter. And and again, even all these years later, I mean, um, probably the most recent place people have heard this song is on an Applebee's commercial. I was reading about that too today, Gar, where they said they started playing that on the Applebee's TV commercial like um, earlier this year when they started to kind of open things up and okay, you can go eat inside a restaurant again. And um, it, it's just, this is one of those songs that you're always hearing it. I mean, I've even been in the car sometimes and heard it, heard a radio station playing the whole song in its entirety. Well, you know, it, it, you know, it, it was. Yeah, I was around back in those days, yeah, and yeah. I was watching the show. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what? You know, for me, you know the, uh, you know, you know the, um, the themes just bring back memories. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, but uh, you know, what about? Uh, let me see here. Uh, Gilligan's Island. Oh yeah, yeah. And what I loved about that theme is, again, it's it's um, it tells you exactly what the show is. I mean, before you even hear one of the actors peep a word, you know what you're going to be watching. <laughs> oh my God, I got I've got it on cue. You want to? Hear yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Here we go. Three-hour tour. Oh, you're taking me back, all right. Three-hour tour. Now, here's a little bit of trivia. Here's a little bit of trivia uh, for you, Gar. Do you know who wrote who wrote the um, the lyrics to that song? No, I don't. Okay, same guy that's behind also the Brady Bunch, the show's creator Sherwood Schwartz. I, I don't know who Sherwood Schwartz is. Uh, he's, he's talented. He's okay. So he's uh, Sherwood Schwartz is a producer and a writer um, for like the Brady Bunch and, and Gilligan's Island, and that's kind of these, those shows are kind of his claim to fame. And um, while we're on the subject of Sherwood Schwartz, um, I, I we need to kind of also talk about the Brady Bunch theme song. And, and again, this is one of those things, Gar, that. Um, you could almost, when you're listening to the theme song, you almost miss this if you're not paying attention, depending on what episode you're watching. Um, but did, did you ever notice, like, originally, like, the first season, they had different people performing the song, and the, some of the um, lyrics were kind of all um, different in the original version? No, I didn't. Okay. It just makes sense, because the, the show became popular, yeah. and I'm sure they got an influx of uh, a better budget. Yeah, so, and so they decided to let's take this and and uh, you know shine it up a bit. Yeah, well, here's what the, here, here, here's what you don't know. Okay, so originally the Brady Bunch theme song was performed by the group, the Peppermint Trolley Company, and I think I sent you this in my email. But anyway, so the original version was um, performed by the Peppermint Trolley Company from 1969 to 1970. While you almost miss it if you're not 
paying attention, like I said, Gar. In the original version of the song, the song ends with the lyric, that's how they became the Brady Bunch. In, yes. In 1971, a new version of a song, I don't know if you've noticed, but a new version of a song was sung by the, by the Brady kids singing the theme song. And the ending lyric in that version of a song was changed to, that's the way we became the Brady Bunch. Yeah, I, I have the original. Yeah, yeah. The, the sure. Original. Yeah, let's hear that. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I just love that. Again, very much like All in the Family, it, it tells you what it is, and there's, I mean, it's telling you a whole story of, um, how they met, and I just love the fact that the guy that created the show, the producer, and the guy that you know thought thought up the concept. I mean, he had never had any um, history of being a songwriter. Just okay, well, I'm going to see what I can come up with, and hey, he does a great job in the lyrics of telling the story. <laughs> well, you know, you watch the beginning when yeah, yeah. you're doing the theme, and it looks like you're on Zoom. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about that. Different people on screens. Yeah, yeah. Just like you know, when, you know, during this whole pandemic, when we were doing band meetings and stuff like that. Oh yeah. You know, instead of having everybody go to one location, we just do it, and we look like the Brady Bunch. Oh yeah, and <laughs> the, the yeah. appetite for destruction bunch. Yeah, and you know, uh, and you know, uh, the next theme I want to talk about, because again. There, there are so many themes that, that are not on here that should be, but um, we only have so much time to talk about this stuff. So next one on my list is Scooby-Doo. Again, going back to my childhood, one of my favorite, you know, you just start singing along, scooby dooby dooby where are you? You get all into it. And I... Oh, I got it. Okay, let's hear that one. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Are you got some work for you now? <laughs> yeah, take me back. From you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, not much to say. Just great animation. Great. Um, that's one of those shows that, again, um, as a kid, I, I just could always get into. I remember so many weekends, like mom and dad sleeping in, and that would just keep me entertained. <laughs> Obviously, we, you and I are thinking alike yeah. because I've already got them on cue. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so keep going. The last one on the list for today, Gar, and I think we are going to do another episode of this because there's so much we just could not include here, but the last one is Cheers. And again, this kind, I just love the theme song. I, I, I mean, it says it all like, you know, Cheers, where everybody knows your name. And um, the interesting thing is, I think I sent you uh, um, the original demo of the original. It had kind of different lyrics, but then they came up with the song. They reworked it and, and they titled it um, "Where Everybody Knows Your Name." And that's that's one of those things. If you watch any episode of Cheers, like um, this one guy that walks in, the character of Norm, everybody starts yelling Norm, you know, or Cliff, or, and and then again. These become characters that we would grow up with. That everybody, as you turn in, you know, you really care about Cliff Clavin, or you know, he seems like a little nerd or whatever. But or Norm, you know, um, or, or Sam Malone, um, or Diane, and, and you start to relate to these people. And um, it was just one of those songs. And what's interesting to find out is the guy that wrote, actually, um, Cheers was written by this guy Gary Portnoy and, and co-written by Judy Hart. Gary Portnoy, interesting enough, was. Um, Prior to write, writing the um, TV theme for Cheers, he, he wrote the hit song I'll Never Get Enough of You by Air Supply, and he also wrote a song for Dolly Parton um, called Say Goodnight. Well, you know, I think you, you really made a good point uh, about, uh, you know, it, that song, uh, you know, theme song, yeah. really, uh, you know, kind of created a draw into where you became drawn into the different characters yeah. because you know because 
you know, every you know during that time when you went to a bar, if you know if you were a bar regular, yeah, everybody did know your name. Yeah, and, you know, and and you know, so that it just set that whole tone. You know, because at that time, going to the bar and and that whole social interaction at the bar was a norm. You know, a, a very common uh, societal thing that people were doing uh, at that time. Yeah. And so it really, uh, you know, it is the perfect yeah. theme song for a show. I mean, for and, and, that yeah. show. And, and and the characters were so really. Um developed in such a way that i mean i think the show would not have worked if they had had a show with your typical you know drunks in the bar but again these became characters we really cared about i mean so much to the point that you know sam's kooky girlfriend diane that you know comes and gets a job um as a barmaid um kind of a stuffy stuck up um thinks she knows it all kind of gal but at the same time you can't help but 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 love who she is, and then the, the guys in the bar, they kind of become her friends, and they teach her how to kind of let her hair down and not be so stuck up, you know. And um, she tries, and then, like, people are picking on Cliff Clave, and they think he's a nerd or whatever, and um, she tries to always get them, the other guys to do the right thing. And so it becomes more more than just a bunch of um, drunks hanging out in a bar. Like, uh, people that kind of come together as a family. Maybe you don't have a typical family, you know. Well, yeah, you know, um, you know, I, you know, there's, there's so many, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, just to interject a, a couple of favorites of mine. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, the, the Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah. You know, that one was an intro, even though it wasn't really musical and everything like, you know, it's just that. There's no, there's no denying what that, what that's too. And, um. Uh, Yes, it is so iconic. Yeah, you know, and 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 then another one, you know, uh, that's you know uh, really, you know, super the the theme uh, for X Files. Oh yes, yes, yes! I forgot about that. You know that one. The second you hear it, you know exactly you know what's coming on mm -hmm. you know and 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 then of course another favorite of mine you know from the back in the 60s is yeah. get smart oh wow you know that you know i i loved that show yeah. if, if if anybody gets a chance to go watch those original episodes the the characters are are you know it's very batman-esque oh yeah that's another one batman you know from the 1966 uh adam west show I, but if you look at that, you know, the lyrics are kind of campy, but again, I, uh, it's one of those things, every time an episode would start, I would start, na 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 na, -na Batman, and, and you, you just know what it is, and, um, yes. and, and I, I think very much like you, another, um, another one I um, forgot to mention is the theme to Sanford, and very much again, like, like you're saying with Twilight Zone, I, I thought, first I wasn't going to include it, because I thought, you know what, um, I don't know that we really could consider this a theme song, but but it it is. It, it's that iconic piece of music by Quincy Jones that um, there's no mistaking it for the theme to the Cosby Show or anything else. We we know exactly what it is, and I think uh, you could have a theme song that's an instrumental piece of music like that. That if it's so, so iconic, it's so recognizable that that you almost have to include it. Yes. Yeah. And then and then there's also the Adams Family. Yes. 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 You know. And, you know, uh, and the Monsters. Yes, and so the Jeffersons. Both of those, yeah. both of those uh, theme songs are, you know, to, to this day are still very, very, uh, you know, iconic. And, and another one I think worth mentioning um, is the Jeffersons because, again, that's one of those theme tunes that, um, that if you listen to it, um, it tells the whole story about how they were once... This poor black family, they moving up to the Upper East Side and um, into a luxurious apartment. And, and it tells the whole story. And then um, what I love about that is that you may or may not be aware of is um, the one that sings the theme song to the Jeffersons is the actress Janet Dubois who played Walona Woods on Good Times. Yes, and isn't she... Uh... I think she also wrote it, yeah. Yeah, um... I'm not sure. Uh huh. Uh, I know she sings it. 
Well, no, no. I was I was thinking along some other lines, uh, you know. But I'm not sure, uh-huh. you know, about my, you know, uh, about fine. that really being a fact. Yeah. So I'd rather rather okay. go ahead and you know skip it. Yeah. Um, you know, of course, I dream of genie. Oh yeah. I've got all these on cue, but you you don't have to listen to all of them. Oh no. But, you know, there's I dream of genie. That's an iconic one. Yeah. Uh, the Benny Hill show. Oh yes. Oh my gosh! Even though it's British. Gosh, you know, the second you hear, you know... It's identifiable, no? Yeah, yeah. Even... Go Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my father used to love to watch Benny Hill. I, I remember that, yeah. There's so many, uh, you know. There's the monkeys. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, just so many um, that we that, that that we should um, include here. It's just so hard to do it in one episode, but that's why I think we're gonna have to do a, a separate episode because, um, like I said, the one list I was looking on today, Gar, like over a hundred TV theme songs came up, and I'm like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, there's married with children. Oh yeah, that's iconic for the '80s, and then also I think another one. Frazier, I mean, the, yes, I yes, mean, he actually sang that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a good voice, doesn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. And then there is the Dick Van Dyke Show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you know, I'm old, so that one's a little more. How about Star Trek? Again, again, um, instrumental music, but I think you're right. Um, very much like along the lines of Sanford Son and, and Twilight Zone. Iconic, because there's no doubt what that is uh, music for. And here's another iconic one. I Love Lucy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going all the way back to the 50s. Oh, my gosh. You know, who, you know, I mean, it it was a mainstay. Everybody's seen every episode of I I Love Lucy at some point in their life. Yeah, and, and if you sit and break it down like we've been doing, Gar, What's interesting is, like, you can go all the way back to the 1950s when uh, Lucille, you know, um, Lucille Ball and, you know, I Love Lucy was big on TV back then. I mean, a lot of those TV theme shows from the 50s, let's be honest, were instrumental music. But then as you get into the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they start, um, they start like, having uh, great theme songs with, with lyrics. I mean, even, even Alan Thicke, you know, from Growing Pains, and he used to be on the Alan Thicke show before that. I mean, uh-huh. he got into the game of, um, I don't know if you know this, that he wrote, um, he wrote the theme songs for both The Facts of Life and Different Strokes. Hey, he's, uh, he's making money to this day. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's dead in the ground now, but his, his um, loved ones are living. Oh, I didn't know he passed. Yeah, oh. a few years ago he had, he had a heart attack and he passed, but yeah, sadly. Yeah, that's too bad. You know, there's, there's uh, the Andy Griffin. Oh my gosh! Starting with that whistle. Oh yeah, I mean iconic whistle. I mean you're you're taking me back. I mean um, I yeah, and it's funny because like like we're saying it, it's a it's a whistle. Who would think that a whistle would become iconic? But but it did. And I think for that, see, see it takes a lot. I mean when you talk about instrumental theme songs, it takes a lot for to keep somebody's attention with just like an instrumental piece of music. That's why like a lot of these guitar shredders. Um, I can get into stuff like Steve Vai or Joe Satriani because a lot of those guys um, is not just a shred fest. I mean, I mean Steve Vai, I remember very first thing I heard from him was on that David Lee Roth album, the song Yankee Rose. And the guy is literally, before I even hear David Lee Roth start singing a word of a song, he is talking to me with his guitar. I don't know if you know what I mean, but I mean, literally talking to me with his guitar. And if you can do that, I think um, that's what makes a song memorable. You want to hear a little side story about Yankee Rose? Sure. I think okay. you told me this, but tell the tell people listening okay. this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Back in the 70s, Okay. Uh, this is when Van Halen was playing in L.A. and when they, they, they were playing in clubs. Uh-huh. There was another band that was playing around in L.A. at that time that was very popular, and yeah. they were called Yankee Rose. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, you know, it, uh, there was a friend of mine uh, that that I knew, I've known for, you know, all the way back to the 70s. His name was Donnie Simmons. Oh, wow. And he, he was the guitarist for Yankee Rose. But there, the singer, I just found out recently, 
is uh, the singer for, uh, I, th- I think it's Mick Brown and the Stones, or I, I forgot his, I think it's Mick something and, and the Stones. I know what you mean. Mick Adams, Mick Adams. Mick Adams, yes. 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 Mick Adams from Mick Adams and the Stones was the lead singer for that band Yankee Rose oh, wow. back in the 70s. Wow. And a lot of people don't know that. Ah. But, you know, that's a little side story, you know, trivia band. History, you know, yeah. Uh, tidbit, uh, you know. Trivia, uh, well. Ab- about that. But I remember when I was a kid back in the 70s and I, I'd see flyers of yeah. uh, Yankee Rose playing here or Yankee Rose playing there. Oh, wow. So so if you were if you were from Los Angeles from that time period when you heard that song uh, Yankee Rose by uh, when David Lee Roth went solo, yeah, yeah. Uh, it always struck that thing because the people in LA knew about the band called Yankee yeah, Rose. Yeah, cuz I remember knowing knowing not, before you told me that story knowing nothing about that. I, I remember when the song came out in 1986, I'm like, what the hell is a Yankee Rose? But again, David Lee Roth is one of those guys. I don't know if that's where he got the idea from. Maybe so. But, you know, he, um, like, if you listen to any of his lyrics, I mean, a lot of the lyrics don't make sense, but they don't really have to, you know, if you can if you can do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, yeah, you know, it's, you know I, it's Nick Adams used to be the lead singer for the band oh Andy wow Rose. anyways Gar so before we let you go I've really had fun doing this and I, I do think we will um, we will um, like have to do another episode to talk to talk about some of the other great uh, TV theme songs down the line but um, even I was saying um, before that what, what we should do is now that we've done like some of our favorite TV theme sh- uh, theme songs we should do like maybe um, some of our favorite like movie soundtracks like come up with a list or something and kind of talk about that in detail but um, before that next time we do this we're going to um, be talking about the 90th anniversary of Frankenstein because um, I thought you know the 1931 um, Dracula film we talked about the you know 90th an- or, um, yeah 90 years of that and um, the 90th anniversary of the, F- the Frankenstein movie is going to be um, right around the corner in November so that's something to look forward to before we let you go though Tell us about what you've been doing the last few weekends. Um, finally uh, back on the stage, um, doing your, you know, little rock star thing. Oh, thanks, Jason. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate. It. Yeah. I, you know, I, right now I am just one of the happiest campers uh, you could ever imagine. I bet. You know, yeah. Because finally, after a year and a half, uh, we're finally able to get up on stage. Uh, three weeks ago, uh, we did our first show. Uh, in, in, in over a year and a half, we did it at, uh, Santa Anita Park, wow. where, you know, where they race horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, they, uh, they did a state fair there. Wow. And I think it was their first state fair. I think they're going to do it again. It's going to be a, an annual thing. Oh, see, so and, thanks uh, to the success. You know, that was, it, I, you know, it just, it just felt like being a kid and getting off restriction. Yeah, yeah. Now you get to go out and play and you get to do what you love and you get to get in front of audiences and everything. And, and I have to say that, uh, you know, I, I've seen uh, footage uh, from our shows uh, yeah. that, you know, you know, three weeks ago we got to do that one. And then two weeks ago, we played at uh, um, uh, Fantasy Springs Casino in the Rock Yard. Oh, wow. And uh, the Friday before that show, because we played on Saturday, but the Friday before that show, uh, NBC News out of Palm Springs asked us to uh, uh, be a guest, you know, on, uh, on um, their news uh, broadcast. And uh, so we did a, a broadcast uh, from NBC News, and um, you can go to uh, our Facebook and okay. see footage. Oh wow, we'll uh, do that of us uh, performing on that news, and it's really, really good uh, video and audio. Uh, so if you've never really seen Appetite for Destruction, um, we'll know, go there and check that out. Really, yes, <laughs> absolutely, and and I have it broken down. Uh, where, uh, you know, if you don't want to watch the whole newscast, uh-huh. you'll, you know, you can just fast over Forward, to yeah. this and you can see this and then you can, you know, jump over to, to this, uh, you know, timestamp 
and you can watch this performance. How cool is that? And, wow. and then on Saturday, we did a show, you know, at Fantasy Springs Rock Yard. Yeah. And uh, the audience was absolutely gigantic. And, uh, you know, they absolutely loved us. It was, you know, we, we came back for an encore. Mm. Um, and then um, last, uh, last Saturday, um, you know, last weekend, yeah. uh, we, you know, we played uh, out in Apple Valley at Hilltop Tavern, and it was the first time we ever played there. Oh, wow, how fun uh, is that? So there's, there was a ton of people that came out to the show, and, but they really didn't know, you know, well, are they going to be any good? So at yeah. the very beginning of the show, the audience was kind of tentative. Hmm. But after we got maybe uh, about a quarter of the way through the show, yeah. everybody was jammed up oh, right wow. there in front of the stage, and they were going nuts. I could hear them singing along with the songs. Wow. And, and they just went absolutely nuts. And by the end of the show, we got called back for an encore. It was just such a great experience. So, it, I, you know, I have to say, the band has never sounded better than, you know, it's sounding right now. Well, I, think I don't for... know if it's just like, you know, the, the fact that we've been cooked cooped up for yeah. a year and, and, and it's just everybody kind of getting their aggressions out. Or, you know, or if, you know, this is really what the band has evolved to. I'm, I'm hoping that this is what the band's evolved to, because I'm, I'm telling you right now, I, I see the footage, yeah. and uh, the uh, band has never sounded this good and this powerful. Well, I'm guessing that it's, it's a combination of both the band and the fans, kind of, um, you got that itch to get back out there and rock, and then, I mean, I mean, like you and me have talked before, Gar, I mean... I never would have thought that, uh, you know, in my lifetime that there would have ever been a time when you wouldn't be able to go see a rock show or be able to go to a movie theater. And, and I think as much as people are itching to get back out there, people also have that fear of it. Uh, you know, I better go and, you know, enjoy this while I can because, you know, who, who knows? There's talk that they may lock everything down again, you know. So I think it's a combination of that. But good for you guys. Well, you know, just if anybody wants to see the footage, you know, mm -hmm. because there are more than one appetite for destructions in the United States. Yeah. There's, there's other people in other states that don't know that we're out doing what yeah. we're doing and everything. And so they're, I know what we'll call our band, we'll call it appetite for destruction. In fact, you, you got the distinction the of... Um... Thing, the one yeah. thing that distinct, you know, distinguishes us from any of the other ones is it's not a F O R, it's the number four. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're if you're wanting to find our website or if you're wanting to find our Facebook or if you're wanting to find our Instagram yeah. or if you're wanting to find our Twitter or our bands in town because bands in town if you uh, if you follow us at bands in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, you know, you'll you'll get notified uh, whenever we're playing. And then and then people um, can also go. Looking for yeah. us, just make sure you're looking for appetite and the number four yeah. destruction. And then people can and also you'll find out yeah. anything that you want to find out about us. And people can also go over to Gar's personal um, Facebook page. You'll find all his links and everything there as well. Well, but don't forget. No, the band. Yeah. This is this is something that you created. Yeah. And, you know, and I absolutely love it. It's just uh, it just warms my heart. Gar Boris's time machine. Yeah. In fact, later when I get done doing this, Gar, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go find the video you were talking about and post it up there so people can check that out. Yes, yes, because it's really, really good footage, and, and they do an, uh, an interview, because it is a news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they do a, a, an interview with me, and, and you know, it's, it's all worth watching. It really is. It's not, you're not going to waste your time if you go check it out. Okay, well, we will post it so people can do that. Now, uh, thank you for doing this again, Mr. Boyce. If you could hold on for just one minute, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Absolutely.